Nope. Oh, do you want to sit, I'm going to sit there. Okay. Um, okay, I think we're ready to get started here. Um, our first speaker uh, in this session is Trevor Sorlin. He's Professor of Environmental History in the Division of the History of Science, Technology, and Environment at the Katheha Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. Uh, he was also the co-founder of the Katheha Environmental Humanities Laboratory in 2011. He's a co-editor of uh, the book, The Future of Nature, Documents of Global Change, and has two books in press, The Environment of History and Grounding Urban Natures, Histories and Futures of Urban Ecologies. And uh, those books are, are co-edited. He advises the Swedish government on environment and climate policy, and it's a real uh, honor to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. It's awesome to be here and to be once again back in Berkeley. I was here the first time in 1984. Uh, and uh, that was not the first time, though, that I met with, uh, with Carolyn, uh, because she uh, came to me first uh, in this place. Uh, well, some of the buildings were, were up when she was there. I think it was in 1982 or maybe 1983. Uh, and uh, uh, she, was, she, she was then already famous in, in, in Sweden and in Scandinavia. And I'm going to come back a little bit to that because that's the main part of my chapter in this book, how she made a very big impact in Scandinavian countries, not really explain, but also a little bit. But she was teaching uh, a graduate seminar, uh, and uh, Kubrin's text, for example, that was mentioned last night, was also on our reading list, as was uh, several other things. And I, there's so many things I can I could talk quite the entire 20 minutes and on, on this uh, semester where she, where she was delivering. But I just want to mention a couple of things. Actually, the question there is, uh, of course, to be honest with you, yes. But uh, also, <laughs> it's a trivial pursuit question. <laughs> so, um, anyways, uh, um, one thing I learned, I started, I learned all my life from Carolyn, as probably my people in this room. And, and one thing I learned was on the pedagogical side, uh, and she, um, she started each seminar after a brief introduction of some text or two, she paused for a moment and just said just one thing. What do you think? <laughs> and that was enough. Uh, what do you think? Uh, and we, after a moment, we started talking also as students, and then the game was rolling. Also, I actually mentioned, uh, I managed to uh, arrange a meeting, if you remember, in my little two-room apartment one late spring night, you know, it doesn't get dark at all. So Arne Ness came uh, to, the, to the campus. Uh, I've also been pretty close to him over the years, now he's gone, of course. And, and um, this was a memorable evening. He had also spent quite some time here, back in the 30s, uh, when he was still sort of partly a biologist, doing some experimentation here with some professors. And they talked and talked. And I asked uh, Karen and, and Arne if they wanted some wine. No. Tea was enough, and and then and after some some hours, uh, the, the kettle was empty, and uh, I I went to fetch more, and then Harley sort of his voice from from the living room got back to me in the kitchen I was, as I was preparing you, just you just take more water, we can use the same tea glass. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to say <laughs> So, um, yes, I speak a little bit from this platform in the, in the chapter and here today that we started some years ago at KDH, um, which is a broadly as an engineering school, but with strengthens of humanities and social sciences. And um, um, so these are just some images of things we've been up to. Mark Arniero is the director. He was on the cover of one of the books that was shown by Nancy in her slides um, a moment ago. Uh, and I, I would like, just like to start with uh, 
cultural images. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, the word is upside down and maybe worse than that, actually. Uh, but I think we've seen many books here, and I think books can fill many functions, and this is one of them. Uh, I would like to see more chairs there, though, um, to, be, to provide this village that Nancy also was talking about. And, and I think directions are now very contradictory in many ways. This is one. Another one is this, uh, and just to symbolize many progressive good directions that we're in uh, the world right now. So very polarized, full of tension, uh, and um, I think in every country we see that. I, during lunch I work and also a brief you on the uh, the Swedish Academy. She <laughs> 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 used to be a safe haven, but no more. Uh, and, and, and just to indicate to give you as an appetizer, if you go on the web and look up Scandinavian countries, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and to some extent Finland as well, you would find multiple connections where you find this is uh, uh, Carolyn's name. Uh, and this is just one lecture notes from a person I think I know who that person is, and just to signify that, that uh, she is, she's only present uh, in those countries. We talk a lot, and she does too, about the Anthropocene. I wouldn't lecture you today about the Anthropocene. I wrote a book about it in Swedish, and I'm trying to get it out here too. Uh, the, the, um, but of course, uh, these are themes that concern us a lot. Uh, and uh, uh, you can consider this and kind of contemplate these works by Nobel laureate in physics against the backdrop of the Alberta tar sands and think about whether we have progressed. And I think in thinking we have progressed, but of course, still this mess is going on. Some politicians try to fight it. Uh, this is Justin Trudeau. Uh, but the, uh, the <laughs> uh, actually, uh, he's also a drama pedagogue. A geographer, teacher, uh, and lots of other things. But you know, his situation is a predicament and a dilemma. Uh, and and uh, the world is again very much, um, again, polarized. Uh, much to be said about the geopolitical conflicts uh, that we are in today. Uh, the background here, I won't speak of that either, but I, I must say, uh, it's much debate about these concepts, uh, what they mean, if they are uh, useful. Uh, but they, they tell us stories, uh, and also I think we can make use of them pedagogically. We can discuss it also during, during the day. And I think this is, a, for me, a, a very important image of uh, how the world is coming together. Here we have nuclear fallout, one of the uh, very significant uh, pieces of evidence that the world is being connected in ways that we may not always uh, think is a good thing, but it, it is, we are connected in more and more ways. And uh, the most beautiful, also aesthetic images of teleconnections bringing different parts of the world together under some common faith is also moving, I think. And the artistic community is very much involved we ran a series of activities in Berlin, in the House of Kultur de Welt, uh, on the Anthropocene campus, and uh, these were fantastic uh, congregations. And I say this not just to um, sort of show off things that I've been involved in, but more to, to say, uh, it's also in the title of my chapter to, to this wonderful book that, that we heard about, uh, that is coming out, that uh, the environmental humanities uh, is also part of the legacy of, of Carolyn's work uh, to a very high extent. And this is yet another link uh, that I will return to in a minute also, the, the Stockholm connection, if you like. Uh, there are many places around the world that have been playing particularly important roles in this regard, and, and Stockholm is one, the Bay Area is certainly another. And I remember Dick Walker, the geographer on this campus, uh, gave, giving a talk on his book about the Bay Area and its history, the environmental history some years ago in Paris, in a meeting, and he said, uh, clearly, he said, uh, the Bay Area is a uh, world leader in, in, in whatever respects, so at least when it comes to bringing nature into the city. And I was in the audience, and I sort of raised my hand and said, 
like we're getting some other city, maybe Stockholm, and then we thought about that for a while. And I was actually a part that contributed to this book that was mentioned about grounding urban nature, and we've had a friendly, friendly quarrel over this over the years. Uh, we've been mentioning other cities as well, but I think it's important to recognize the legacy, and it's also local. Some local places speak to the world. Uh, we've seen the, uh, some evidence already in the previous uh, uh, talks about uh, the reception of Carrie's work, and that's part of my chapter really. Here are just a couple of colleagues uh, uh, in Sweden who were very early in commenting on the death of nature. Two of her friends were uh, passed away last year. Uh, Ronnie Anderson just turned 80, who was just putting out a new book uh, with uh, a former student. Uh, Recognize. And, and uh, he's now writing about the Arab world and its intellectual history. Here are a couple of uh, other early um, uh, comments uh, on the death of nature. In fact, this David Rokutne uh, comments were also back in the 80s, but this was in both in 1995. Kies Wunde in Denmark uh, also wrote a review. And this is a bit fine print, but if you were able to read it, you would be able to see that uh, I've actually worked for this chapter with a bibliometrician uh, in Stockholm to assemble, really go to the bibliometric sources for uh, Carolyn's work. And um, this is uh, on the left hand side the Death of Nature citations over the years, mostly in the 90s, it had its peak, but it's still being cited. Uh, over the years, and the countries are on the right hand side. I won't comment on this because you can't read it, but I hope you can. But you cannot, this is not sharp enough. Okay, on, on my screen, on my PC, this comes up very clearly. But let me maybe just walk and talk you into these slides a little bit. So, then we'll follow a few of these. But basically, the main message here is that uh, if you look carefully into how Carolyn's work is cited, and in this case, it's the death of nature over the years. You find it, it's being clustered in a number of spheres, and these are marked by colors here. But again, it's very, how much can you actually see? Very little. Put the shade down further, actually. It doesn't help much, I think. I have to sort of explain it to you, it's not terribly complicated. But it's, it's um, these, you can see at least the United States, uh, uh, and other countries also surround it, like England, Canada, Australia. Uh, these are, um, uh, just the, the, the size of the, of the circles indicates how much the book is being in, uh, cited uh, in different countries. And clearly this reflects the size of these scholarly communities. But you can also see Sweden, up there, very close among the, um, uh, the, the slightly bigger uh, circles. And um, so, and if you then move on to this one, you could, it's the same, basically the same pattern, but this is um, another approach to it. Technically, let's see the details aside here. But the main message here is that you have Canada, Australia, England, the English speaking countries, but when you move the next step down from them, you find uh, the Scandinavian countries well represented. And even countries like Germany, Spain, um, France, and others that are much, much bigger than the Scandinavian countries don't cite. Uh, yeah, well, maybe I can do this now. <laughs> but if you can, well, I'm going to point you to the boy, actually. Uh, so, uh, um, yeah, so. <laughs> okay, so here, if, if you press that, press yeah, that press the red button here, yeah. and there, uh, press it down hard. There you go. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I need to find it here first. Uh, uh, well, you we have sweet up there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, this was a surprising effect. This is a Mac uh, yeah, <laughs> technology. Here is a little bit more of these, um, uh, and this this is about keywords. 
If you look, this is actually very interesting indeed, how certain keywords also cluster. So the blue here, knowledge, um, gender, women, there's one cluster of uh, where, where you can group articles that cite uh, and have the same keywords. Then you can move up here to green field with um, concepts like science, history, feminism, and there is a red cluster up here about sustainability, um, politics, ecology, uh, and given the that the image isn't so very clear, let me just summarize the message here, namely that uh, this analysis shows what I think many of us have already observed when, if you're interested in it, work, that the work speaks to a, a number of scholarly communities. Those interested in feminism and gender issues, those interested in the history of science, those interested in the environmental history, and also something that is linked more towards psychology and the spiritual. And uh, that is not so very common, that one scholar's work speaks to several communities in this way. And I think that is very much part of the, uh, again, this is just another way to organize the same, the same message. So uh, let's not go deeper into this. But that is very much part, I think, of the, of the fact we heard about before, namely that there are so many citations to be from the scholarly work in in, in, in history and environmental history and history of science. We are, I'm afraid we have to simply leave this uh, uh, because we can't see very much of it actually. But, but you get the point, there is a way of analyzing this. The numbers will come out much more clearly in, in, the, uh, in the chapter and also uh, not just the death, but also several of our other books that we just mentioned who we did analyze. They are uh, the definition of ecological revolutions, radical ecology, earth care, and reinvent Eden. So these are the works that we have uh, on which we have based this uh, analysis. Uh, I say we because I worked with this guy, Tobias Jackson, is his name. Uh, I couldn't do this myself. Uh, and well, at least now, uh, I did mention Arnie Ness, and, and certainly he is an academic uh, representative of the, of the um, preparedness to uh, be to build an interest in Carolyn's work. But if you want to explain the very solid reception uh, uh, and the many citations in the Scandinavian countries to her work, I think it's much more important to go to the modern history of these countries, in this case, Norway and Sweden. Uh, and Norway is here represented by Ruhal and Brunton, who, uh, of course, chaired the uh, UN uh, Commission in the mid to late 1980s uh, on our common future, and uh, not coined, but launched on a broad scale the concept of sustainability and reported in 1987. To the right, Sweden can be represented by equally a social democratic politician, Olaf Palme, here in his home, on his home turf, literally, uh, in the suburb of Stockholm in the early 1970s. Uh, he became a prime minister later. Uh, Stockholm was also the place of the UN conference, as you know, and if you want to take a closer look at global environmental governance that started growing in these decades, uh, and that was a major phenomenon. Uh, again, uh, the Scandinavian countries have hit above their weight. Uh, and uh, here is more strong during that conference. Uh, it was also uh, a conference uh, that follows. It not started, so it is just early out in a pattern that has been uh, very common when it comes to big international, including environmental conferences, with lots of uh, civic activity uh, also. Uh, there was a cordon sanitaire between the uh, diplomats and the business people in the, in the core of Stockholm and the suburbs where they put up camps for the, for the protesters, but Molly Strong went out there and gave a talk uh, and engaged with these people. You had also other civic um, unrest around the urban environment in Stockholm, the famous Battle of the Elms the year before, for example. Uh, and uh, I just want to sort of indicate, since 
I can't expect that many of you are familiar with these things, a few um, elements of, of the, the kind of soil where the uh, merchantian message could take root in, in, in Sweden. And uh, just around the same time when the UN conference came up, there was also a major shift going on in the Academy of Sciences, uh, led by uh, key, key names in science. Uh, Ambiel, the journal, was founded in 1972 as well. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, people involved in the starting of that journal was Paul Gritson, who then in 2000 launched the Anthropocene concept. And he worked for many, many years in Stockholm, and, and of course, he became also an open laureate. He was involved with the Academy of Sciences, which is on the right hand side there, where the globe, one of the major um, um, both system science and global change science programs was also hosted the International History Advisory Program. And if you want to summarize this, you could say that there are a few uh, strands of this uh, green history of Soho uh, that I pushed when I quarreled with Rick Walker. There is both the civic activity and, and you have the high politics uh, linked to government and so on. And you have this quite sizable and ambitious and progressive research tradition. And here is a representative from the, from the civic side, uh, uh, a, a woman politician in the first several decades of so who was, uh, on the 20th century, was building the um, movement for allotment gardens, for example. And her brother was a colleague of both, both from the political left. Uh, here they meet, he meets Lenin when he passes through on, on his way to make a revolution, as we did here about. Uh, and he also engaged with, with the local Sami. He had very progressive, so to speak, modern red green kind of ideas. Uh, and uh, so that was the civic politics side. He was a mayor of Stockholm for several decades. Uh, Bert Bolin is in a very strong tradition of metrological sciences. Uh, linked uh, to um, the work that we recognize this term. And the real key person here is this guy, uh, Carl Gustav Rossby, uh, the inventor, so to speak, of the concept of the death screens, mm -hmm. and also made equations for that uh, in the early 40s. He spent much of his career, uh, here he makes a statement of the end of his life on, on climate change, and the role of carbon dioxide. He spent a good deal of time in the US as a leading meteorologist. Uh, here he works the first couple of years in the US Weather Bureau, and then he moved on to work at the universities of Chicago and MIT and others. Uh, and then he returned to Sweden uh, towards the end of his life. His uh, ancestor, so to speak, intellectually, was Santa Arrhenius who uh, wrote the letter for him when he went to the U.S. So there is this string of events linking together the uh, early CO2 theories uh, across to Roski's work also in America. And, of course, uh, Roski was involved in this project as well. Uh, and the Swedes did a similar computer uh, in Stockholm, uh, uh, which for some years, around the middle of the 1950s, was actually uh, far more powerful than the Princeton computer. And so you can say that there has been a Stockholm School of Climate Science or Earth Systems Related Science that is part of this broader political story of the reception uh, that is paid the ground. So this is the argument I've had to build, also with similar uh, observations from the Norwegian side and some lesser uh, um, dimensions of, for the, for the Den Denmark, which is the third country that I have already visited. And this links, I think, back to the uh, to this concept of the environmental humanities. So, uh, because I think that actually, if you look at Karen's work, uh, it's been repeated during these couple of days already many times. It's not just environmental history or ethics or philosophy, it's all of these. And what we're having now in the last 10 years or so is the growth of precisely this broader connection between the environmental humanities disciplines across the board. And uh, again, I would say that what we try to do is not come in, in our department, uh, KDH, in those years has been to build precisely this integrated uh, uh, connections between different uh, dimensions of the, of, the uh, of, of those strands of humanities that Carolyn has been working on. <laughs>
So, um, somebody used the word humbling before, I should use the same. It's been very humbling to draw on her legacy in, in our work over all these years. So, thank you very much. Do you want to do a So we have about 10 minutes for questions, comments, discussion. Well, just an observation from having been in those countries, the Scandinavian countries, in contrast to uh, France, Germany, England, do have uh, lots of access to the natural world in terms of parts of their landscape uh, remaining wild. Of course, parts of German, French, English landscapes are abundantly agricultural and parts are urban. But Scandinavians have that access to sort of, whatever you want to call it, original nature natural history in a way that much of the rest of the world is lost. Uh, yes, that, that is of course very true. And um, Sweden also um, had an early start on natural, natural parks following the American example. But the Norwegians did not, for example. And the Finns didn't either. So they came very, many decades later and um, so if you bring up original nature, I should also like to bring up the concept of natural resources in, in it. There's lots and lots of research in these small countries to, to develop the resources. So the natural sciences in the 19th century and early 20th century became very uh, much backed up by the governments that wanted this to happen. So to build the foundation for these kinds of science, uh, stories that I just gave you. So it's actually both uh, both the original pristine uh, nature and also the resource dimensions I think are important. Yeah. Uh, linking to last night's talk, um, Sweden was also the country in Europe that uh, responded most enthusiastically to Silent Spring when it first came out in Europe. Um, so what is it exactly about the Sweden? <laughs> uh, in five minutes. Uh, yes. So, um, well, some is, I think, embedded a little bit in, in what I've said here. I think it's also um, maybe a, um, a tradition of starting in between the two world wars to build um, uh, the welfare state very solidly to sort of come together around a political idea in that case. And um, that has brought a certain element of, um, maybe not so strong anymore, of, um, let's call it rationality, some kind of belief in a rational approach. And um, it, it, then when a message comes about the environment, like in, in uh, the case of Rachel Carson that we also heard uh, last night. Um, I mean, you can relate to that in many ways. One way would be to sort of push it away. Another way would be to say, well, actually, this might be the way to go if you want to develop your country towards even further rationality, even a more rational relationship to nature. Uh, so that would be my take on it. And you're perfectly right. There has been a major study about the, the uh, reception of Richard Carson's uh, work in, um, in the 60s, and also how it actually spurred the use of the Swedish word environment, namely milieu, mm -hmm. on the base of the French, that really took a leap in 63, 64, the translation of, of the book into Swedish in 1963. Uh, but of course, there is always something enigmatic in, in explaining why certain countries uh, take it. But I would see the familiarity between 
the environment and other dimensions of modernization, basically. Where Scandinavia is different from the Russians do next door. It's a dramatic contrast. Clearly. It's a contrast. Here, of course, it is. Anybody else? Okay, well, thank you very much for uh, stimulating. <laughs>
more ecological and more systemic paradigm. And of course, he also, like there, Halcott did, pointed out the changing paradigms in science with quantum mechanics and relativity theory. So I was really um, intrigued by the parallel emergence of these two strands of thinking. Um, I put it down in terms of feminist spirituality. I also thought in terms of kind of the reemergence of the feminine or ecofeminism as um, you know, one branch of thinking that just really exploded during that period. And then, of course, alternative paradigms in science. So I was interested in exploring the possible connections with them. And it was in Capra's book that I first learned of Carolyn's work. In his um, book, The Turning Point, he quoted, he included this quote, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but it essentially captures her thesis about the way in which mechanistic science sanctioned the domination of both women and nature. So that's inspired. I started graduate school in 1989 wanting to write about science and the goddess. So it's ironic that I ended up writing about five white men. <laughs> um, uh, Ludwig von Berlanti, Kenneth Bolding, Ralph Gerard, James Bird Miller and Anatole Rappaport. The last three together formed the core of the Behavioral Sciences Committee at the University of Chicago. And it was actually a really fascinating project. And it gave me a focus for exploring systems thinking as a possible alternative to the mechanistic paradigm. Um, there were two distinct dimensions in my graduate career. First, of course, was my graduate work in the history of science, which focused on the history of systems thinking, uh, once I finally found out its focus. Um, and the second, uh, and actually far more rewarding in many ways, were the teaching opportunities in what was then the Conservation and Resource Studies program that later merged with environmental studies and planning, or I think for some science and management, whatever it was. I remember this. <laughs> Carolyn told me they, for a while they were thinking environmental policy, management, and science, so it would be EPMS. <laughs> <laughs> but they changed that. <laughs> <laughs> so I worked as a graduate student instructor in several courses with Carolyn, Alan Miller, and Arnold Schultz. But my all time favorite was Carolyn's course in environmental philosophy and ethics which I taught for four semesters, once as the primary instructor. That, that course was most closely aligned with both my research interests and my personal passions. Carolyn's exposition of environmental philosophy and ethics inspired my own inquiry into the philosophical and ethical implications of systems thinking. One of the concepts from the course that was particularly relevant to my own research was her discussion of egocentric, homocentric, and ecocentric ethics. She described the egocentric ethics, which is characterized by sort of competitive individualism, as an outgrowth, a direct outgrowth of the mechanistic worldview, justifying the exploitation of nature and other humans, and ushering in the industrial revolution and the rise of modern capitalism. A homocentric ethic, you know, alternatively, seeks to serve the interests of humanity as a whole, but still fails to take into consideration the larger environment in which the human community is embedded. So ultimately, an ecocentric ethic values all life as part of an integral whole. And that theme was kind of further developed in Arnold Schultz's course in the Ecosystemology, which I also taught several times. It was Arnold who introduced me to Wes Churchman, who was then teaching ethics in the Peace and Conflict Studies program at Berkeley. And Wes was the one who inspired me to write about the founders of the Society for General Systems Research, which has since become the International Society for the Systems Sciences. Both he and Arnold had been members of that group 
and West had served as president in 1989-1990. So it really was an ideal project in the history of science to be able to explore some of these themes. Because when I first came in saying I wanted to write about uh, new paradigms in science, you know, the, the more sort of old school faculty in the history of science program just rolled their eyes. <laughs> um, so anyway, there were um, three main parts of my dissertation, which, as Nancy said, was published in 2003 as the Science of Synthesis. First, I trace the sources of systems in a wide range of disciplines, including biology, engineering management, cybernetics, information theory, and ecology and social theory. And that was a fascinating uh, cross project to really delve into the sort of intellectual roots of this idea, um, which emerged pretty much in the early half of the 20th century. Uh, the final two chapters, which I didn't want to try to squeeze onto this slide, um, provided a summary and evaluation identifying what I saw as the primary contributions of Keo. And the main part of the text documented the work of the five founders. I have included Miller and Gerard Rappaport in the Chicago Behavioral Science Group. Um, the two whose work was most meaningful for me were Ludwig von Berlanti and Ken Boulding. Boulding, I, I'm not to say a whole lot about him, but he was really the inspiration for the whole field of ecological economics, the International Society for Ecological, um, for ecological Economics gives annual, at least they used to, an annual Ken Boulding Award. Um, and he was an amazing person. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm just gonna say a little bit about Berlanti. He um, described his approach as humanistic in contrast to some other developments in the broad field of systems thinking. He was extremely critical of the of mechanistic science and particularly with regard to its reductionism and determinism. And he was vehemently opposed to the behaviorist orientation in psychology which he called the robot model of man. Um, and I think that's perfect. <laughs> he um, believed it portrayed the organism as essentially passive and contributed to a view of humanity that justified totalitarian control. In contrast, he emphasized the potential for creativity and spontaneity in living systems. Um, so, Two characteristics of a systems approach are one, an emphasis on relationships between the component parts of the system and between the system, any system and its environment. Um, the founders envisioned the society as a way to bring together scholars from different disciplines in order to address the complex challenges confronting humanity in the 20th century. Arnold told you to talk about messy, other messy problems. Um, and, and that, you know, all these separate disciplines were working independently and not really communicating with each other. And they felt that systems was a way to bring people together. Ideally, a systems approach could support a more inclusive and democratic social order and contribute to a more integrated and collaborative approach to education. Of course, not everyone saw systems thinking in such positive terms. Critics described it as a kind of totalizing narrative that reinforced social control and promoted a technocratic social order. And certainly there were developments in, under that broad umbrella of systems, particularly, particularly in some applications of systems analysis, systems engineering that might be seen in that light. But challenging these views, the, the thesis of my research was to demonstrate that there were indeed developments in the systems field, and particularly within the group that, that these guys founded, that actively nurtured more democratic and inclusive forms of social organization and decision making. Um, most of my research in the last 20 years since I left Berkeley to teach at Sonoma State, has focused on delineating the various schools 
of thought in the broad field of systems. Because there's so many systems engineering, um, uh, what organizational learning. I mean, there's just a whole range of them. And that's been kind of a fascinating project. And um, more relevant, I think, to Carolyn's work, articulating what I see as the philosophical and ethical implications of a systems approach. In the latter endeavor, I have been inspired by Carolyn's more recent work where she articulates a partnership ethic, uh, which entails equity between and moral consideration of both human and non-human communities, as well as respect for diversity and an ethic of inclusion. Although my focus is somewhat different, I think this orientation is implicit in my own exploration of the philosophical and ethical implications of systems thinking. Beginning with uh, an ontological foundation, a systems approach entails a shift from a mechanistic to an organic conception of nature, a shift from a reductionist approach, focusing on the parts in isolation, to an emphasis on patterns of relationship and on organization and interdependence. From that foundation, a systems of epistemology recognizes the interactive nature of knowledge, the creation of meaning through the processes of interaction, the way in which the observer is integral to the process of observation and can't really be separated from what is being observed, and the importance of multiple perspectives, no longer privileging a single vantage point. And this ultimately leads to West Churchman's claim that there are no experts in the systems approach. Um, so from my perspective, a systems ethic implies a shift in emphasis. Um, and these contrasts are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but a shift in emphasis from control to collaboration, from comp competition to interdependence, from hierarchical to participatory social organization, <clears throat> and from objectivity to an inclusion of the subjective and intersubjective dimensions of human experience. And hopefully, the cultivation of greater self-awareness as an integral part of a larger system, recognizing as, um, I think the name of the eco, um, or the ecological self, the, the idea that I am the trees, I am the forest, they are my lungs, that sense that we really are part of this larger being. So um, in closing, I might suggest that a post-mechanistic science would highlight our role as active participants in the creative processes of the universe and that understanding our interdependence with all our relations, we might embody a commitment to working for the good of all. Can we just stand up and pass it right? Sure. Questions? Um, I just want to thank both uh, Sarah and Deborah for these wonderful tributes and I appreciate them. And I want to just point out a connection between the two papers. And that is the woman and nature connection. And it was in 1982, I was in a sabbatical and I was in Hawaii and I was writing what ultimately became ecological evolution. So I'm sitting in the breezes of the tropics and the phone rings. And it is a woman named Abby Peterson. And she says, um, I am Abby Peterson and I am in Fumio and we are just under the Arctic Circle. <laughs> 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 and she said, how would you like to be <laughs> <laughs> and, um, She said, we have the 
possibility of, uh, of a Fulbright scholarship, if would you like to apply, because we would like to nominate you. So, um, of, co of course, I said yes, and eventually it came through. And it was actually in the spring of 84 that I went there. Mm -hmm. And I went there, um, and I taught two courses in, at the University of Julio. And one was called Nature and Culture, and that was the one Sperger was involved in. And the other was called Woman and Nature, and that was uh, the work of Ingrid Lundstrom and Abby Peterson, and uh, those were two, two uh, courses. And so it turned out that Abby Peterson and I wrote an article on women and the environment in Sweden. And it's actually republished in my book, Earth Care. Mm -hmm. um, and it talks about um, all the women in Sweden who very early on recognized the connections. Ellen Wagner, for example, mm -hmm. uh, she wrote a book on um, a, 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 a book called The Alarm Clock um, <laughs> in the 40s, and uh, Peace with the Earth, Fred McJordan. And then there, um, was um, Sarah Liebman and uh, Flori Gatte, who was uh, a partner with Begum. And I interviewed many of these women while I was there, and Abby and I then wrote this article. So I, I think that was a, you know, that happened just before you came mm -hmm. and began uh, building on this work on women and nature. And so I think there's a really interesting connection here between uh, these two uh, papers that you have presented. Thank you. Mm. Any other comments or questions? I will say, um, since it, it seemed like women sort of disappeared in the evolution of my research, <laughs> that um, I, I became... <laughs> president of the organization and, and hosted the annual conference in 2006. And there was one other woman who had been president of that group, which was Margaret Mead, back in the early years of the 19, well, probably early yes. 60s, I think. So I was the first woman in recent times to be president of that group. And that particular conference was really, really fun. It had a wonderful planning committee and we did a lot more interactive kinds of um, sessions where we did a world cafe, we, we had people engaged, and a lot of really creative events in the evening. So it totally changed the quality of that group and the annual conferences to where it became much more playful and fun and interactive. And there have since been several women who have presided over the organization. So we sort of invaded the systems for that Great. particular one anyway. It's necessary, a yes. necessary move. Okay, Absolutely. well, it is now lunchtime and I invite you all to the uh, room in the back and uh, thank you so much for watching.